Eldritch Room. Hometown was once a quiet, largely rural community. Until, as often happens, much larger powers decide to move in. An expanding empire takes over the land around the small community, and the old town is now surrounded by a rapidly growing fortress and city. A more threatening military presence is felt, and poverty quickly creeps in as the expanding empire takes advantage of the residents' stone hometown. While the younger generation at least attempts to adapt to all the changes, the older generation deeply resents this intrusion into their old home. Many of the elders, including Asgore and Toriel Dreamer, Father Alvin, Mayor Holiday, and her husband Rudolph, form their own tight-knit group that soon spirals into a cult. They're a small community with no means of standing up to an empire's armies. But there's always been old whispers of things far more powerful and terrible. Old gods and strange horrors that hail from a dark world parallel to their own. The cult focuses their attention specifically on tales of a dark prince. A goat-like entity made of fire and shadow that can pacify any enemy. Surely, if they can gain the favor of something so dark and powerful, they'll have a means of driving away all of these intruders and restoring hometown to the way it used to be. However, as everyone knows, trying to call up old gods demands sacrifices. Mayor Holiday, having gotten the group together, tries to take the brunt of this duty and first sacrifices her daughter. December. However, it seems to be a botched ritual, and nothing useful results from it, leaving the mayor extremely bitter. The other elders are tasked with picking up vagrants or other troublemakers to try and successfully complete this ritual. But none seem to work. Unwilling to offer up their own dutiful son, Asriel, the dreamers instead adopt an orphan from the poverty-stricken streets of the enroaching city, Chris. However, they find that upon adopting them, Asriel quickly forms a close bond with Chris. Asriel, like most of the younger generation, is unaware of his parents' and grandparents' intentions. Chris is not easy to take care of sometimes. They have weird interests, aren't very clean, and are often disobedient. Despite this, Toriel and Asgore find Chris growing on them, too. The thought of sacrificing them gets harder and harder to swallow. The other elders start to pressure them, questioning why they're so intent on keeping this weird little orphan around. Aren't they the symbol of everything going wrong with their little community? And with this invading modern future? Toriel continues to put it off, using the excuse that she is doing extensive research to make sure that they finally do this ritual correctly. While she is indeed conducting research, she also knows that they can't do anything with Chris as long as Asriel is around them. However, when Asriel was offered an extended stay at the city's new university to get advanced training as a scholar, is where this story truly begins. It has been only a week since Asriel left for his training. 
Are you feeling any better about it? Hmm, I guess. Well, how about something to take your mind off it? We would like you to come with us to a gathering tonight. And if you go and get washed up, you may have half a butterscotch pie before we go. I just baked it today. Huh? Okay. Later. Thank you, Chris. You look very nice. There's pie? Uh, of course. As promised. <laughs> uh, mm, 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 mm. Uh. <sighs> I'll take the other half if you have it. I know you would, but that will have to wait for later. We need to start out. Where are we going anyway? W well, we... It's sort of a surprise party. In the middle of the woods? Well, we don't want any patrolling soldiers barging in and spoiling a party, right? Mmm, yeah. <sighs> Ooh. Chris, are you alright? Just really tired all of a sudden. We must not be late. Kinda <sighs> dizzy. <sighs> Don't worry, I've got you. So Something's wrong. Can't feel my arms and legs. Do not worry. It is fine. We are almost there. They're stirring. We should bind them. Huh? No, no! The records. Say the demon wants willingness, not corrosion. <sighs> if we tie them, it will not appear as proper. It won't look proper if they run <laughs> off during the ritual, either. I measured the herbs carefully. It'll be another 30 minutes before the paralysis wears off. Then let's begin the ritual, quickly. I... I have studied so much. It has to work this time. If it was easy, it wouldn't be a sacrifice. It'll be worth it. We are here to call forth the Demon Prince of the Dark. He who can pacify any enemy. We offer this sacrifice as an act of goodwill to the Prince, that he may overtake our enemies. Toriel, tell us how to give this gift. No salt, so that the demon will not feel entrapped. Instead, Flour and sugar, as one would give a neighbor. Fresh flowers that the gift smells sweet. And the mark of the demon prince, to show who the gift is intended for. And most importantly, do not break the chant until the ritual is complete. M Mom? <laughs> Demon Prince of the Dark! Hear our words! Accept this sacrifice and appear before us! Demon of the Hearth and Shadows, hear us. Mum, what? Why are you. Demon of the Fire and Darkness, to hear us doing this! We summon you as neighbors in need. We summon you as enemies around us. Mom? Our offering to you is waiting on the table. table. Mom? Our offering is ready to be accepted. Azriel? Bring us the safety of the house. Help me! Bring our enemies to the house. Well, where's the prince? Why isn't the demon here? N no! Another failure. 
No, I worked so hard. We did everything right this time. Why did it not work? The dreamers are distraught at this seeming failure. After they work so hard to ensure that they did this right. The remaining elders double down though, insisting that they have to keep trying. Asriel returns from his training and is devastated to find his sibling missing. Toriel and Asgore, unable to admit what they did, lie to Asriel and say that Chris had a huge argument and left home on their own. Asriel vows to search for them and bring them back home. And while his parents tried to dissuade him from this, they're unsuccessful. Hmm. Um, excuse me, you can't be back here, young man. This section is restricted. Yes, I understand that, just... Professor Drake's back in the historical wing. I noticed that he forgot his honey scones. And you know how he gets when he's been cataloging all afternoon and misses lunch. I just thought I'd see if the headache can bring it to him. <laughs> Very well, just to the historical wing. Quickly. Of course, of course. Okay, that old man said if it was anywhere, it'd be here. Hey! You again! How did you even get in here, you annoying mutt? <sighs> well, just keep it down, okay? Of course nothing's labeled. That'll be too easy. Hmm. Assuming this starts the section on local folk religions, the one on occult rituals should be. Huh? Not here? Where is it? Where ah! You mutt! One of these days you're gonna get me killed, you know that? No one's supposed to be in here! Later. Right, shot, young man. You know they got a curfew going on. I know. I won't be long, sir. Denizens of a world of darkness. Hmm. Sealed to this dark realm are beasts of immense size and terrifying power, said to speak in tongues unknown to man. to man. While varied in size, shape, and abilities, these beasts share a similar nature of feeding upon humans and their souls. While impossible to know for sure, it is speculated that the inherent potential within all humans is as nutritional to these monsters as bread and meat is for man. If these beasts were to be released into the world we know, a great roaring calamity would come upon the land. Even the most practiced of magicians would struggle to stop such creatures. It is, therefore, a great relief that these beasts were able to leave the world of their own accord. I don't know if that's helpful. The undoing of Pax. Maybe cross-reference this one later? Comprehension of Greater Demone, most contradictory among the demon monarchs of the Dark World, is Ralse, a prince of darkness. His entity embodies the shadows cast by the hearth, the loneliness of spaces between the warm comfort of company. Fire and shadow alike are attributed to this demon. This being is said to quell any enemy, no matter how great a threat they may be, and yet, other tales describe this demon as a king to a pleasant neighbor, 
delighting in companionship, much debate has ensued over reconciling these two narratives. But is this truly a contradiction? The fire that burns pleasantly in the family home is the same fire that burns down a city and devastates the lives of all who live there. Brotherhood becomes the madness of a mob at the turn of a coin. The true terror of Rao Se is the loneliness said to reside in whatever spaces a demon's soul would be. This demon will do all that is asked of it to obtain the ultimate prize. A human soul forever bound to it in the LIGHTS OUT CURFEW! <laughs> Meanwhile, unknown to anyone in the light world, the ritual was actually successful and transported Chris to the dark world. Right into the home of Rause, the very dark prince they were trying to reach. Rause is delighted to finally have an actual human from the light world visit him. Sure, he's heard about all those previous sacrifices, but they never actually got to him. The dark world and the afterlife aren't really the same place after all. Chris, however, is infuturated and despondent. They've already had a very hard life as an orphan. And now, just when it seems like they had a new family they could trust. That trust was broken by adults who once again threw them away for their own purposes. Ralse, ever cheerful, assures them that they must be here for a reason. And that he has a means for them to not only return to the light world, but get retribution for what happened to them and their hometown. The dark world is full of eldritch beasts, strange demons and old gods after all. He can grant them the forbidden knowledge and ability to speak to and even command these eldritch beasts. Once they form a strong enough bond with the beasts, and make it through the bound gods that may bar the way, they can bring them back to the world of light, and command them to do whatever Chris would like to the people living there. However, such power and ability comes at a high cost. Chris's Human Soul Chris, seeing little other option and not feeling much attachment to humanity anyway, agrees and sells their soul to the Dark Prince, Ralse. Ralse excitedly promises that he'll take extra good care of their soul, and that he'll accompany them as they befriend the Eldritch Beasts lurking in the Dark World. This arrangement certainly has some other benefits for Chris, too. In addition to this forbidden knowledge, Ralsei's control over their soul grants them a degree of invulnerability. If Chris dies or is somehow psychologically destroyed, Ralsei can use it to revive them completely. Ralsei gives Chris suitable armor and weaponry for this venture. And the two set out into the vast dark realm of strange horrors, lost cities and twisting paths in search of new friends and a means back to the light world. While Chris is unsure about this journey at first, Ralse is all smiles, excited for them to gain some friendships that they clearly, desperately need. Of course, he's excited for other reasons too. Those cultists have been calling out to him for such a long time. And now, with Chris's human soul, he can finally enter the light world. Chris can forge the bonds they've been lacking. Rause and the Eldritch Beasts they find will finally have access to the human world. And the people clamoring for terrible things to happen will get exactly what they asked for. How could that not be a happy ending? <laughs> uh.